Today we have uh, David Schmorenze as a speaker, another talk from Prague, but this time most of the work was done in Prague. <laughs> and and uh, it's uh, over to you, David. Okay, thank you very much, Dima. And hello, everyone. So today I would uh, like to tell you a little bit about uh, some experiments that we worked on recently in Prague, which are mostly focused on uh, quantum turbulence and superfluid helium-4 in some specific flow arrangements, which break the fundamental rule of, of turbulence research because we are looking at inhomogeneous flows rather than homogeneous ones, which are the ones which can be understood with less difficulty. So we are somewhat complicating the situation here, but uh, I'm hoping I will convince you by the end that this is sometimes worth the extra effort and that we can learn some interesting things uh, studying uh, these type of flows. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank all the people who have worked on the experiments with, with us. So these are our students, Shimon Midlik, Filip Novotny, Max Golanya, our ex-postdocs, uh, Zhu Linxie, Junhu Huang, Jakub Kvorka from the geophysics department of our university, and of course, our, our boss group, group head, uh, Ladik Skrbek. Okay. So I will specifically talk about uh, two types of flows. First, I will discuss, after some brief introduction, I will discuss spherically symmetric counterflow with a heater placed into, into the center of a spherical cavity, causing counterflow in the radial direction. And uh, look at what can we learn about quantum turbulence generated in this geometry. And then I will uh, switch gears a little bit to mechanically generated turbulence using uh, oscillators such as wires and tuning forks and uh, using this as a as a natural transition i will speak a little bit about uh, local probes for for these inhomogeneous flows what could be useful uh, how could they contribute to our understanding so i will start with a general introduction Probably all of us uh, know that uh, helium is a special substance among uh, others in that it has a superfluid phase at very low temperature and low pressures below 25 bar. And it is this superfluid helium phase called historically helium two that we'll be talking about today in the rest of the talk. This is usually described in terms of uh, the two fluid model, which was first proposed by Landau and then amended. The most important amendment was the discovery of quantized vortices. And today we describe helium usually in terms of uh, HVBK equations, which govern the, equa the, the dynamics of the viscous normal flow and the inviscid uh, superfluid component, and uh, take into account also the mutual friction force which uh, exists between these two flows with independent velocity fields and independent densities, as is highlighted here. A special case uh, of flow that can exist in superfluid helium, which cannot exist in classical fluids, is so-called thermal counterflow, when these two components flow in exactly opposite directions so that the mass transport cancels out, basically. And this will be the case in the, in the first flow that I'm going to discuss, this uh, spherically symmetric thermal counterflow. Uh, superfluid helium has other special properties besides that it consists or works as if it is made up of two components. Another special property is that uh, in the superfluid component, circulation is quantized. Uh, this is for the reason that uh, the superfluid corresponds to a quantum mechanical ground state, which is described by a macroscopic wave function, which is supposed to describe the condensate in the, in the lowest energy state. This means that basically as a direct consequence, the superfluid should not rotate as such. The, the curl of the superfluid velocity is identically zero if we substitute into this wave function. However, this is contrary to experimental observations as a parabolic meniscus with a profile that corresponds to the full density of the fluid rotating is observed when you put a bucket of helium on a rotating platform and superfluid rotates by inserting topological defects into its volume inside which superfluidity is suppressed and around which the superfluid component can rotate. These are of course called quantized vortices and we have at our disposal this beautiful visualization by Greg Bewley. Uh, 
using uh, hydrogen particles. And circulation around these vortices is, is quantized in units of kappa, which is given down here. All vortices for practical purposes in helium-4 can be thought of as singly quantized because a multiply quantized vortex would be energetically unfavorable and would break down into multiple singly quantized vortices. These vortices can basically undergo an instability, which leads to a production of turbulence. So let's now consider the case, let's say in the zero temperature limit where we don't have any normal component. Uh, these vortices can be created from scratch in the bulk of the fluid by means of intrinsic vortex nucleation, but the velocities needed to achieve this are rather high of order of 10 meters per second. And therefore, in experiments, they are typically nucleated extrinsically from pre-existing C loops, which can be created uh, either by cooling through the superfluid transition at finite speed via the Kibler-Zurek mechanism, or simply left over from a previous experiment, or simply forming in the volume of the fluid because of the rotation of our planets, and so on and so forth. So in helium-4, unless great care is taken, we always have uh, quantized vortices in our sample. These vortices, when they are subjected to a counterflow field or to an oscillating velocity field, Kelvin waves are uh, excited on them. These are helical waves on the vortex core. And uh, this is important because being helical, they can cause self-reconnection and the emission of vortex rings, which then propagate. We can think as, as ballistic, ballistically propagating vortex rings away from the source loop. And if many of these vortex rings are created with different self-induced velocities and different orientations, they can reconnect and they can form a turbulent vortex tangle, which is what we usually understood by, by the term superfluid turbulence or turbulence in the superfluid component. This uh, type of instability leading to self-reconnections has a critical velocity, which can be defined from considerations of vortex dynamics. I do not list it here, but the general dependence is that it scales with the square root of uh, kappa and omega, where kappa is the quantum of circulation discussed here, and omega is uh, the frequency of, uh, or angular frequency of oscillations if we are work, working with oscillating flows. And this was uh, put together by Wilfried Schepp and Risto Hanninen in their, in their GLTP paper some 10 years, 12 years ago, maybe. Apart from that, uh, instabilities can occur in the normal component as well, which gives rise to a very vast field of uh, different turbulent states in, in superfluid helium, which hasn't been explored completely as of today, I believe. Although I often hear opinions that uh, helium-4 is basically a finished business and a well-characterized system and nothing new can ever be done there. I, I beg to disagree with this statement. I think there are lots of things we don't understand about helium-4 yet, especially in connection to two fluid turbulence and uh, the interaction of, let's say, different types of turbulent flows. But we will get to that later. So I will start by describing turbulent flows now. And uh, obviously I will start with classical turbulence. So following Kolmogorov theory from uh, the year 1941, we can uh, describe the energy spectrum of turbulent flows uh, in dependence on the wave number. So high wave number means small scales and low wave number means large scales in our experiment, right? So we can imagine a very simple system. Let's say we have a cup of tea. We have a teaspoon with which we are mixing it. So the largest possible scale in our system is the size of the cup. That's this scale here. The size of the spoon at which we are inserting energy into our flow is located right here. And according to Kolmogorov theory, which is based on several assumptions linked to self-similarity of the turbulent flow and uh, some other properties, which I will skip over now, the energy is transferred without dissipation throughout what is called an inertial range to smaller and smaller scales until such a small scale of vortices is created that uh, viscous dissipation starts to be important for their flow. 
which can be expressed in terms of a scale dependent Reynolds number at large scales. This tends to be uh, a large value, let's say 1000, 10,000 at uh, this dissipation scale. This is by definition equal to one, meaning that uh, viscous forces are comparable to inertial forces and the dissipation in the flow becomes significant. Kolmogorov's theory leads to this uh, famous scaling law that the uh, energy spectral density depends on the wave number as k to minus five thirds. And uh, this leads to several important uh, results for classical turbulence. I am not sure I have listed them here directly, such as the decay laws for energy and uh, for vorticity. We can discuss them separately, but uh, basically, especially in homogeneous classical turbulence, for example, vorticity is expected to decay as T to minus three halves. I will be discussing that actually in connection with uh, turbulence and superfluid helium in one of the cases that we'll be talking about. So looking at uh, superfluids now, so the situation is slightly different. Uh, in the classical turbulence, the mechanism that causes this cascading transfer of energy from large scales to smaller ones is actually vortex stretching. And uh, this is a mechanism which superfluid cannot always mimic. Usually superfluid turbulence tends to mimic classical turbulence at large scales, but it cannot mimic all mechanisms. And for example, this vortex stretching can be kind of copied by the superfluid only if polarized structures exist in the flow consisting of many quantized vortices, which can change their distance, which can change their spatial extent. But a single quantized vortex cannot be stretched anymore. And therefore, this mechanism has to fail at some point. And now the question is, at what length scale this happens? So we can define a quantum length scale You've probably heard uh, Vladik talking about it at uh, LT conference or somewhere else, which is defined in direct analogy with classical turbulence, just replacing kinematic viscosity with the quantum of circulation. And this quantum length scale basically tells us where the cutoff of this cascading process should occur in, in our energy spectrum and where kind of classical like turbulence cascade should be replaced by something else, namely Kelvin wave cascade. And now uh, we can have two different situations. Either we are driving the flow at a length scale, which is smaller than the quantum length scale, in which case no Kolmogorov-like inertial range can form. And we have an unpolarized tangle of quantized vortices without any large scale structures. And in this case, such a tangle is described by Vinance equation, which gives us a steady state solution where the vortex line density in counterflow is proportional to the counterflow velocity squared and it should decay as t to minus one. Whereas on the other hand, if we are driving at larger scales, which exceed this quantum length scale, or if we are driving so hard that we are creating so many quantized vortices that this scale basically shifts down to here, then something like an inertial range can form and a classical like decay could be observed even in a pure superfluid turbulence in the zero temperature limit. And yes, here I give the decay low with T to minus uh, three halves. Right, so we have these two distinct types of turbulence and uh, they can be detected experimentally, for example, by looking at the decays or looking at their steady state behavior in some special cases. The difference between these two uh, types of turbulent flows is uh, the existence of large scale structures in the flow. So what can cause such large scale structures normally? Usually it can be submerged bodies which are moving through the superfluid where vortices can form in the wake. Uh, generally, if there is large scale turbulence in the normal component for any reason, this can by mutual friction force drive large scale turbulence in the superfluid as well. Boundaries are a, let's say, specific case of moving submerged walls, which can also lead to large scale structures. And uh, famously in the thermal counterflow, this was investigated by uh, Jim Tuff, who has defined uh, or identified the T1 and T2 states, which were believed to differ exactly by the presence or absence of, uh, of uh, turbulence in the normal component. 
which drives the flow at large scales, which was later confirmed by Wego's group in Florida by uh, excimer visualization. As you can see here in this lower graph, uh, both types of decays have been experimentally observed, depending on the level of the initial drive in, in various experiments. This, I believe, is a thermal counterflow experiment in a, in a straight channel. So what is specific about spherical counterflow? Uh, we are generating the flow by a point-like heater in the middle of a spherical cell. So the external boundary of the cell shouldn't matter so much in this case. And we are hoping to actually obtain a flow from which we remove this boundary, which is thought to be responsible for the generation of this large scale flow in, in channel counterflow. Uh, what we can say before even starting to experiment is some, let's say, very, very rough estimates, very rough uh, scaling laws, which we should expect. So from conservation of, of entropy, we would guess that the counterflow velocity would be radially dependent with R to negative two. By a naive application of uh, the Wynan equation, when we apply it locally, neglecting effects like uh, vortex diffusion and vortex uh, annihilation or creation at boundaries, we would expect that the vortex line density would also have a radial distribution with uh, R to minus four dependence. And based on HVBK equations, we can estimate that the temperature will also have a profile changing from the center towards the uh, exterior of, of the spherical cell, roughly as R2 negative 5. Of course, reality will be a little bit different because we are making some very, very uh, rough estimates, some oversimplifications to, to describe this problem. Uh, one of the effects is uh, what happens with vortices at surfaces exactly. The other is that the Wynan equation as such, though it was derived for thermal counterflow, was derived actually for the homogeneous case where vortex diffusion is neglected, basically. This temperature profile, just calculated based on sort of ideal considerations of the flow field, will be different once turbulence develops on large scales in the normal flow, for example, if it happens because of the nonlinear terms in AGBK. And of course, uh, all of these work only if uh, this temperature perturbation is small in comparison with the absolute temperature of the of the sample. Let's say if it's thermalized to the helium bath, then with the temperature of the helium bath. Because if we need to start taking into account the, the radial dependence of temperature in this equation, the radial dependence of entropy and of superfluid density, things can get more complicated. And of course, in any real experiment, we will have geometric imperfections and so on and so forth. But this is the general description that should be at least to some approximation valid and expected. There have been numerical works on spherical counterflow performed uh, over the last few years, starting with uh, Emil Vargas' work uh, with uh, the vortex filament model, which was uh, later supplemented by very nice simulations by the Newcastle and by the Osaka group. And uh, for example, as a result of this uh, simulation done by uh, Carlo Baring, Yuri Sergeyev, Fedrickinson and uh, Andrew Begele, it became obvious that some description of the temperature gradient is necessary in this kind of problem. They worked on a cylindrical counterflow, but the same applies in the spherical geometry. So without this temperature gradient, a steady state cannot be obtained which was also confirmed by this work by the Osaka group, where actually a time-dependent vortex line density was produced as a result of these simulations. And the steady state was never completely fully realized, but from the properties of this time-dependent angle, interesting quantities could be extracted and interesting facts could be learned, such as the radial distribution, which seems to follow a very peculiar shape where with very few vortices close to the heater and uh, kind of spherical shell of vortices evolving gradually and uh, moving slightly further away from, from the point like heater, just finite sized in the simulation. So the first thing we have done in our experiments, or actually not the first thing, but uh, say a characterization measurement is to try to measure this temperature profile. <clears throat> 
Unfortunately, the powers which we can supply to, to our heater are rather modest if we want to avoid overheating the entire cryostat if we still want to keep our temperature regulation working. So the best we can say is that the measured data, you can see this is a temperature gradient of a few tenths of a millikelvin at the distance of a few millimeters from the heater. The best we can say that this is consistent with an inverse power law where the power is indeed between five and six as, uh, as more or less expected. This was published in GLTP and this uh, gave us kind of indirect confirmation using thermometers on different sides of, of the heater that uh, we are investigating the right kind of flow and that for example, this capillary on which the heater is uh, located does not destroy the flow field in the other directions too much. The final setup that we used uh, looks like this. Uh, there is a brass spherical cell made out of three pieces, basically a ring which holds the heater and then the two hemispheres which are mounted on it from, from two opposite sides. The sphere is 20 millimeter in diameter and the heater itself is 1.2 millimeters. And uh, we have also installed second sound sensors, uh, let's say on the poles of this sphere. On, here it would be on the north and south pole. And um, we use them to measure the vortex line density, kind of weighted or weighted average vortex line density in the entire sphere. And we use it to determine what happens in the flow. So of course, uh, this is a complicated geometry much more complicated than, than a linear channel for which analytical expressions can be derived easily. So here we have to resort to numerics if we want a good description of the second sound resonances in, in the spherical volume. Fortunately, this is where the help was very much appreciated by Jakub Korka from geophysics department. He managed to do these calculations using decomposition into spherical harmonics and he could uh, perform these calculations. These analytical calculations down here in the third panel are done from uh, by simply by solving the, the Helmholtz equation in spherical coordinates. But uh, this doesn't uh, take into account any dissipation whatsoever. So to solve a dissipative model, a numerical approach was really needed. Fortunately, it seems that the resonances that we see experimentally can be more or less reasonably mapped to some of these peaks calculated analytically and numerically. So we have a reasonable understanding of uh, what resonance we are measuring at. And for our experiments, we have chosen two specific peaks. This highlighted is actually one of them. The, the main criterion was obviously the quality of the peak and the Q factor, and also its separation from other peaks. Uh, none, none other in the vicinity. So we have uh, used two modes uh, at three kilohertz and at nine kilohertz approximately. Uh, the radial profile of the amplitude distribution is uh, shown in a simple manner in this graph. So L here denotes uh, uh, the spherical harmonic actually. And N is the index of the zero point of the radial dependence, which is met on the external boundary. We are not considering uh, full 3D dependence on the azimuth angle, as uh, this would lead to degeneracy in frequency in any case. So we simply set it, set the last quantum number to zero without loss of generality in this case. I am also able to show maps of sensitivity of the second sound modes because the sensitivity is proportional to the square of the amplitude of the mode. So for the lower lying mode, the, the sensitive areas are located rather close to the heater with some secondary ring closer to the outer wall. With the higher resonance, this is a kind of more, uh, let's say, more representative distribution of all the, all the volume in the spherical cell. And we are using these two modes to measure vortex line density, as I said. So the experimental results uh, look approximately like this. I am not showing vortex line density because in principle to convert second sound attenuation into vortex line density, I need to make some assumptions about uh, homogeneity and uh, about the degree of polarization of the vortices with respect to the direction of propagation of second sound. 
So I'm showing the damping of the second sound mode expressed as the inverse square factor, which exists in excess of uh, the damping, which would be there without any vortices generated by the counterflow. So this should basically scale with some weighted average vortex line density in the cell, but I'm showing it on purpose as an inverse Q factor so that we can avoid confusion when discussing vortex line densities and when discussing these numbers. The interesting feature in these graphs, uh, so this graph has been obtained with the mode at three kilohertz, this one at nine kilohertz approximately. The story is uh, very similar using both modes. The main feature is this plateau in the in the middle of the powers applied to the to the heater. When we plot this as a function of the counterflow velocity, so that the dependencies from individual temperatures collapse more or less on a single curve, we see something like this. So here I'm cheating a little bit by saying that here the let's say average vortex line density should be proportional to the counterflow velocity at the heater wall squared. But we see that in this middle region, the measurements differ at each temperature. And uh, although we don't have a clear evidence of what is going, in, going on inside the cell, we believe that this is due to turbulence being generated in the normal component by means of the mutual friction force via the quantized vortices which have been produced, let's say, already at lower powers. This is uh, in a striking contrast to what has been observed in uh, one dimensional channels. I have a comparison here. So using this very old picture from Tufts paper. So in the T1 state, uh, the description is such that uh, turbulence exists in the superfluid component, but there is no large scale turbulence in the normal component. When it becomes created here at the second critical velocity, the number of quantized vortices increases suddenly jumps up and goes on to a new dependence here we have the opposite situation the number of vortices is suppressed we believe that this is because in this case large-scale turbulence in the normal component created due to the boundaries due to the channel walls actually supplies energy to the superfluid and helps to generate more quantized vortices. This is why this upward increase is ob observed. But in our case, since the outer wall is almost insignificant, the velocity is very, very low towards the outer wall of the cell. We have an opposite situation. And we believe that uh, the superfluid turbulence actually drives the normal fluid flow. And hence, all this extra energy, which would have been normally put into creating more and more quantized vortices, gets absorbed by the normal component instead, which we obviously cannot see in second sound attenuation. And only at a later stage, the generation of uh, quantized vortices is resumed at, at a rate comparable to the initial one. Of course, uh, this is to some extent speculative. And we still don't have a direct experimental evidence of turbulence in the, in the normal component generated in this middle range of powers, which would survive, of course, in, at the higher powers as well. But uh, we are hoping to provide this evidence reasonably soon. And in the meantime, we can focus on other interesting properties of this flow under observation. There is a kind of hint uh, that uh, tells us that normal fluid turbulence could be responsible. We can calculate the Reynolds numbers for, for the normal component, meaning basically what we call the Donnelly number, which is pretty much the Reynolds number defined for the normal component alone in this case. And for some of the powers that we applied, you can see that they change, differ here by two orders of magnitude and correspond really to the powers we are really inputting into the system in this initial stage, in this middle range, and in this high power range at the end. Uh, we get uh, values of this uh, Donnelly number, which are crossing the critical numbers from similar classical flows. Of course, there is no perfect analogy in classical fluids to, to a radial flow like this, but there are some loose analogies, let's say. We can look at a laminar submerged jet, which is also a form of a diverging flow, or we can look at a flow in the in the diverging channel, 
And doing a brief literature review gives critical Reynolds numbers, let's say between 20 and 50 by estimate. So at different powers, we can actually have different situations and close to the heater, we can, for example, be driving turbulence in the normal component, but away from the heater, we are not doing anything. At a higher power, this transition will move further and further away from the heater. And at the highest power we are applying, all of the normal component in the entire cell should actually be turbulent. So this is a small hint that, uh, that normal fluid turbulence may be indeed responsible for what we see. Another interesting feature is uh, the way in which this uh, turbulent flow decays. So we can obviously measure the decay rate using second sound technique. And almost universally, we see vinyl like decay. You may notice that uh, the experimental curves are perhaps not perfect, but uh, they are definitely closer to T2 minus one than T2 minus three halves. And the small modifications may be there exactly because the flow is not really homogeneous and we are working with a more complicated system than the Vinan equation was made for originally. We can try to model this uh, decay of inhomogeneous flow based on some simplified assumptions. Yeah, by the way, the same is of course seen with both modes of second sound that, that I have discussed. So we can make a simplified model assuming that uh, the decay according to Vinan equation works locally. This is of course a strong assumption, I would say, but uh, let's start with it. So there are some indications, for example, in papers by Avshalom and Schwartz that this might not be too far from the truth. So let's, let's take this as our starting point. And let's uh, start in an initial state, which corresponds to the simplified assumptions I have showed uh, previously that the vortex line density will be distributed according to the steady state solution of, of local violence equation and therefore proportional to the radius with negative four. So this is shown here. And if we let this system to decay, and obviously because the decay rate is quadratic, the high vorticity regions will decay faster and the flow will homogenize rather quickly within a few seconds here, I think within a fraction of a second, maybe even and then continues decaying as a homogeneous turbulence. This would translate into our averaged vortex line density, more or less in this fashion. And we should be indeed able to reproduce this T2 minus one decay law at, at times which exceed this, say relaxation time to homogeneous flow. So it is again, believable that in our experiment, we are seeing this because we're looking at a system that decays in a way where homogenization occurs first on very short time scales, and then it decays basically as a homogeneous turbulence would. So at this point, I can probably summarize uh, what, uh, what has been said about spherically symmetric counterflow. Uh, we have experimental evidence that uh, in a certain range of applied power to the heater or in a certain range of counterflow velocities, if you will, uh, the energy is input from the superfluid component into the normal component, which becomes turbulent. And we have evidence that this really behaves as an unbounded flow driven at small scales, which manifests in this decay law as derived from Binance equation. What would be really useful here for, for, for the future would be actually to probe vortex line density locally, of course, this is an integral measurement using the second sound attenuation across the whole sphere, as you have seen. So local probes would be really useful and we would very much like to try them in this uh, in this experiment. We have also been considering working in cylindrical geometry because this is relevant to, to some other investigations that have been carried out recently and has been simulated by the Newcastle group extensively. And we are also considering to investigate the interplay of this perfectly symmetrical flow or well almost perfectly symmetrical flow by taking lifting of the degeneracy by rotating the spherical cell and looking at the interplay of uh, this symmetrical counterflow with rotation all right uh, i'm wondering maybe i should 
Okay, uh, I have a question here from Philip Roche in the chat. And I was also going to give give a chance to everybody to ask questions about the spherical asymmetric counterflow right now. So I will start by answering this one. I'll go back a little. So I'm wondering if I ever showed a graph which would actually quote this vortex line density, but no, I didn't. In any case, the highest vortex line densities we were able to, to produce in our paper or in our in our experiment, if I uh, use the formula for homogeneous turbulence, was something like 10 to 10 uh, inverse meters squared. So this would be roughly one order of magnitude lower, 10 to 9 inverse meters squared. So is there anybody else who would like to ask something at this point? I see some raised hands. So I don't know in, in which order you guys raised them. So uh, let, let's have a question from uh, Wei Guo here. Okay. Oh, hey, um, David, thanks for the talk. Very nice. Um, I have a question. Um, so you measured line density decay and then you observed this one over T uh, scaling, which suggests that the flow is, uh, the turbulence is violent turbulence, uh, which means there shouldn't be any large scale uh, flow structures, supposedly. Uh, then uh, from your um, heat flux versus, uh, no, no, I mean the, uh, uh, the other port, which is, uh, um, From the steady state measurements, you mean? Yeah, yeah? the steady state measurement. Can, can, can you show that plot again? This one, yeah. Where you, yeah, you showed this plateau, and you suggest that this plateau probably suggests some sort of a turbulence in the normal fluid. So, um, does this mean that this turbulent flow in the normal fluid must also be <clears throat> some sort of a violent type? without any large scale flow, because otherwise I would imagine there would be large scale flow in the, in the flow, right? All right, uh, this, this is, I, I understand where the question is headed. My understanding is such that uh, normally in counter flow, you would say that the, that the superfluid component is driven at the length scale, which corresponds to the kind of mean intervortex distance. Actually in helium four, if you look at the numbers, what would happen if you drive the normal fluid at the same scale, which is uh, some tens of microns in, in this particular experiment, you actually find out that with the energy decay rate, which corresponds to the powers we are inserting in, even if I, let's say, partition the power among superfluid and normal fluid according to the densities or, or do something like this, I can still have an inertial range roughly for one decade, and the Kolmogorov scale would be somewhere around units of microns. So the terminology can be a little bit misleading because what I would call large scales in, 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 in normal flow where I'm inserting the energy, in this case, it's actually smaller scales than the intervortex distance or comparable scales to the intervortex distance. And the Kolmogorov scale is actually smaller than the intervortex distance. And to me, this was first very counterintuitive because we are not used to thinking in, in these terms about normal fluid vortices existing on scales less than the intervortex distance. But sorry, actually- sorry. Uh, David, sorry, I, I sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. If, if this is the case, then wouldn't you expect to see strong mutual friction between the two fluids? Uh, because at a scale below the line spacing, the two fluids cannot get coupled. And uh, if this is the case, you would have a strong dissipation in the normal fluid, and you would not expect to see a common growth uh, cascade, right? You're more or less following my thoughts exactly. I also asked myself this question. And my very naive answer is that if I am at scales below the intervortex distance, it might well happen that there are no vortices in between which would actually cause this mutual friction, right? So there is some, let's say, empty volume within, within the superfluid where normal fluid is allowed to flow at liberty because simply it's not touching quantized vortices. Uh, 
at such small scales all the time. Of course, statistically speaking, it will interact with them every now and then. But do do you see what I mean? Yeah, I I, I guess so. Okay. Well, uh, we, we can have uh, more discussions later. Thank you so yes, much. Yes. Yes. I think I did try to put some numbers on this here. Of course, this is this is rough estimates again. So maybe this uh, this helps a little bit. I'm not sure. Uh, if we consider the flow to be driven at the 70 to 80 micron scale, then the dissipation scale based on the Reynolds number indeed falls somewhere to units of microns. And this is, I mean, this is using the language of classical fluid uh, mechanics, of classical turbulence. So I, I don't see any reason why it couldn't be so, actually. Helium has such a low viscosity, even the normal component, that uh, this can happen. All right, so let's uh, let's move to other questions. Uh, I have Yuri Sergeyev here. Yeah, uh, David, could you uh, well uh, somewhere closer to the beginning of your talk? You uh, were telling about uh, your HVBK uh, simulation of spherical uh, counterflow. Uh, oh, okay. I, yeah. Uh, Maybe not of spherical counterflow, just of spherical second sound resonances. <laughs> uh, right, okay. Uh, mm. But anyway, uh, did you sort of, what, what did you have, uh, uh, well, what uh, as a replacement for the uh, Wynans equation for the vortex line density? Was it any, any sort of uh, conservation type equation for L? Yes. For so, Actually, when we were working on the simulations of the spherical resonant modes, so let me find that somewhere. I, I don't show the equations here, sorry. Uh, but we expressly simulated them, of course, in a vortex-free state. And only later we introduced some uh, artificial damping, which was thought to mimic that some distribution of vortices can be there. But this has to be introduced artificially. Right. So, so, uh, the, so the only thing, the only other thing which I can take from HVBK here is these estimates of the temperature gradient, right. and this basically follows from from this assumption here. All oh, right. So it's, it's yeah. more or less. Uh, but this is another thing. Yeah, uh, written for for the spherical case. Mm -hmm. not, yes. not not the generalization uh, of the equation for L. No, no. no. Okay. We would very much like to have something like that, but uh, we are not there. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I, I understand mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And and your uh, later measurements, well, closer to the end of the talk, uh, when you were talking about decay of L. So what we have here is the decay of the global L, of the average. Exactly, L. yes, yes. Right? But, but you don't know yes. how the local, what happens to the sort of local vortex line data. Exactly, you are right. So I can only speculate that if local decay existed, it would behave like this, and we should be able to reconstruct one over two, one over t decay. But of course, I don't know that this is the case in the real experiment. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it, it can be rather subtle. That that that's why 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 I'm sort of asking mm -hmm. that. Lo okay. Local L can behave a bit in a bit different way. That's what. Certainly, certainly. All right. Okay. Thank you. But the the talk was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, we have Luca Galantucci. Hi, David. Uh, Hi. Thanks for the for the nice presentation on, on this uh, spherical counterflow. So I had two questions. One, the one was uh, actually what we asked. So uh, we can say that the um, the normal fluid is forced at the intervortex spacing, and therefore that th 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 there can be like a, um, a cascade to the um, to the Komokorov scale, even though we don't know if it's actually an inertial. Mm. So you, an inertial. So you, you said that it might be that there is some there, there can be because there is like uh, this decay between vortices. But so actually mm -hmm. in that region we could have it is not for sure that we have k to the minus five thirds, right? Is sure. Correct? Okay. It's not sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. And so and, and the second is when you. Um, show the, uh, uh, the the scaling that uh, L goes to like uh, VNS squared. In those, um, uh, in the previous, exactly, it, 
is it possible to estimate like some kind of slopes just to compare with tough or in the sense is it possible to use this data to uh, um, derive some gammas which uh, re refer to uh, non-bounded counterflow Yes, we have actually looked at the gamma factors, but I don't remember them now. I'm sorry. <laughs> I would like to give you a comment on this. Uh, maybe I can track it down later and, and send you a message if you like. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, because we're doing some, mm -hmm. some simulation homogeneous uh, mm -hmm. and turbulence, and of course, I mean, we wonder if it's uh, uh, if it has. Sense I, I remember that the agreement wasn't perfect; that, that there was a difference from from one D counterflow, but I don't remember which way. Sorry. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Yeah. Ah, Vladik has a question. Mm -hmm. I don't have a question, but I rather have a comment because as I, I was waiting till the end because I kind of hope that uh, uh, David is going to use this argument, but it is relevant to Vegua's question. So we tried uh, in a different experiment to create and to drive quantum turbulence by a very small fork. The fork had uh, just prongs just being of the order of 100 microns or so. I think, could you maybe wait a second? This, <clears throat> this is actually a second half of the talk, but I'm not sure what the time allotted to these seminars is actually, whether I'm still allowed to continue or not. Okay, then if, I keep if, quiet. If, if they allow you to talk, yeah. so we shall see. Yeah, we'll probably do have uh, five minutes or so, or six or seven. Five or six Go minutes. On. All right, so let's just look at that very quickly. So I was actually going to switch to mechanically driven flows, as I advertised at the beginning of the talk. So, okay, let's just uh, give you the, the quick run of it. So I have two experiments with a vibrating wire and with a tuning fork here where we actually were able to measure uh, vortex line density against some kind of average integrated value uh, in a second sound resonator where we placed these oscillating bodies. So this is the intra. I don't think it's terribly exciting to look at it. Uh, basic characterization of these devices. Now this is more or less understood within the, the dynamical similarity that, that we tried to describe in this paper. What is interesting is that we see some three different regimes. So for example, with the vibrating wire, we see this kind of uh, regime I call number one at low powers where the power we input into the wire is proportional to the velocity cube. And then it transitions into U to the power of four. In a compensated graph, this would be very clearly visible, but uh, I'm using this total graph because I kind of want to show how it behaves and show the real values rather than compensated ones. And interestingly, in this first regime, there are very few vortices created. This is, again, a second sound damping, which should somehow scale with vortex line density. And vortices only appear in this second regime here. And this uh, extra damping seems to be proportional to this vortex line density, if, I, if I'm allowed to call it that. And for a vibrating wire, the experimentally accessible range was always such that uh, the vortex line spacing was in excess of the wire diameter. So the wire, which is 60 microns, was smaller than the intervortex distance, maybe except for this highest point here. With the tuning fork, there is a crossover actually uh, observable. And we see regimes two and three. We don't see the first one. I'm not sure why. And the extra damping scales with a different power of the observed second sound attenuation or average vortex line density. This third regime can be understood, understood reasonably well in the, in the framework of uh, quasi-classical turbulence again. But we have to take into account the kind of volume dependence of everything. So this would actually lead to, to the kind of effective volume of turbulence growing linearly with velocity, but then everything fits together and makes sense. However, this second regime is kind of a mystery, but perhaps it's better to illustrate it on decays. So for very high drives, we see Kolmogorov type decay at late times, as should be expected after length scales are saturated in, in classical flow. Vinan type decay is basically almost not observed at all, and if, then only at very, very fast initial decay of the Vinan type. 
and then we see something rather strange that we don't understand. And uh, this is a type of decay which seems to scale more or less with the square root, inverse square root of the time. And this is really something I have seen for the first time in these type of experiments, and I don't have a very good explanation for it. So any ideas or any theoretical input would be more than welcome. I have some working theory that this might be related to mutual friction, but uh, it's not certain that this second regime maybe could be dominated by mutual friction in terms of energy transfer from one component to the other, but uh, this is this is by no means certain. Or this, this type of decay could be simply some kind of transient between the initial decay and this one, where the length scales are not saturated yet, because we're again working in an inhomogeneous flow. So maybe some new physics is really to be expected here in, in comparison with homogeneous turbulence. On the plus side, this could tell us perhaps something with, with careful analysis and with some theoretical background about the transport of quantized vortices, which is an information which is missing in the Weinan equation, for example. So we are hoping that something might be obtained from here. And this is probably the, the summary of, uh, of uh, mechanically driven flows. So Weinan type decay can be observed with them and uh, quasi classical decay can be observed. And on top of everything else, we have this unusual decay law, which, which I haven't seen anywhere before. And this is more or less the, the gist of what I can say about this in, in the time frame which is given. All oh, right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, David. So, any more questions? We have, a, have time for a couple. Oh. So, what was the uh, comment in relation to uh, Way's uh, <clears throat> uh, Way's remark? I think Vladik. Yeah. Should I answer? Not sure. Okay, so I only wanted to say that if you drive the turbulence mechanically at the length scale, which is smaller than intervortex distance, and you drive it mechanically, it was always thought that you create Kolmogorov-like turbulence. And I wanted to say that this is not true because the decay is Weinan type if, if, if you follow the vortex line density. So it really depends on which scale you drive turbulence and you can do drive uh, mechanical, mechanically at the length scale, which is smaller than the intervortex distance. And then the decay is winding like. So that's just a remark which I wanted to, to have, which is relevant to the question which, which we go ask. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely very interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yes. I think- uh, Thanks, Ladi. I, I think Philip also had another question. Yes, if I may, I have a, I had a question on the first part. Um, if you monitor different spherical harmonics and the dissipation of, of them, could you um, do some uh, tomography and, and, and estimate the spatial distribution of vortex line density without any local probes? Like people do to look at uh, the grounds, you know, to look at petroleum, mm -hmm. etc. I, and I understand you know. what you mean. But usually, to, to get reasonable spatial resolution, I would need quite a lot of different spherical modes to, to be able to reconstruct this. And usually, from the experimental accessible ones, which are of reasonable quality, I can use probably two, three, five modes, but not more than that. So this would give a very limited picture. And the most uh, problematic thing is that the fundamental resonance, actually, which should be the most important in this reconstruction, is usually of rather low quality, so so the data would be poor. But what we could do, on the other hand, probably is, uh, let's say, take a result of a numerical simulation, take a spatial profile of vortex line density, and calculate what a given resonant mode would see, and try to kind of reverse engineer this. If if you if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. And but I don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you if you make the, the, the size of the, the second sound emitter and second sound receiver much smaller, 
maybe you would be able to to, to resolve more modes because mm. you have some special averaging which stems the, the, the signal. On the other hand, uh, you have really excellent uh, second sound probes, which are microscopic, and it might just be easier to use something like this to, to do local measurements, I'm wondering. Well, well you're, you're welcome to use them. <laughs> I, <laughs> okay. I, I, I could send some if you want, yeah. Well, this would be perfect, actually, yeah. We, we can discuss separately that. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so that's great. So maybe one short question, if anyone has any. Yes, but I think local probes are really necessary for, for these type of flows. And uh, as, uh, as Philip suggested, so something like that uh, would be an excellent way to go. We are trying to you know, do some developments in Prague as well, but with mechanical probes, we are trying to use vibrating wires to measure vortex line density. We have even calibrated them in thermal counterflow, and it seems to work. And a smaller device than this would even have uh, probably sufficient sensitivity to be used as a local probe. But then again, we need a well-defined magnetic field and so on. So, so mechanical probes are, are complicated at this point, unless really it's a nanomechanical device operated, let's say, with a gated electrode or something like that. We'll have to see. Or maybe really some, some tweezers with a nanomechanical device at the end. But this would be so fragile that I'm worried to <laughs> even think about it. So a second sound measurement actually seems to be the best choice so far. OK, well, it was a very productive seminar, I think. So uh, the next one is in three weeks time. And we're going to talk about uh, time crystals. It's going to be 22nd of November. Uh, also, we have now a section on the website with other advertisements of jobs and PhD positions. So if you want to advertise one or you, if you know someone who's looking for a job or a PhD position, please uh, refer them to the site. Uh, well, thanks a lot, everyone. Have a nice uh, rest of the day. Thanks, David. Thank you very much, Dima.